Aditamastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Om may the divine being look over us lovingly as a mother and father. May the divine being support and nourish us as a mother and father. May we have the strength and skill to study together the art of spirituality. May no misunderstandings arise amongst us. Om peace, peace, peace be unto thee, unto us, and to all your beloved children everywhere. All, all dearly beloved ones are gathered here this morning, many of you and thank you for coming. Uh, the topic this morning is revelation. We're taking up three words this, these last three weeks that have specific technical meanings within spiritual traditions, purification, revelation, and salvation. Of course, they have meanings in common speech as well. And, uh, Almost incidentally, of course, that will be dealt with, but uh, we'll begin with a reading by Cindy of the uh, material that was sent out to explain in this last week's newsletter what today's talk would be about. So, Cindy, if you would be so kind as to read that. Last Sunday, we spoke of purification. When the purification of your heart is nearly complete, you will begin to experience revelation. As Jesus and Sri Ramakrishna told us, all that was hidden will be revealed. Here is a quote from Revelations, King James Version. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Now, of course, this has been widely uh, ascribed to the idea that <coughs> the end is near. Well, the end is near for each of the persons who keeps those things, reads and keeps those things, as is mentioned in that quote from Revelations King James Version. The end is near the end being revelation and then salvation, uh, freedom from limitation. We start with this idea of purification, where it begins at birth, but as it progresses, and most particularly if we take it into spiritual practice, it purifies the idea of our being the body, mind, and intellect. And we see that the sense cravings are nothing more than a restlessness of the mind. This is what Swami Prabhavananda would emphasize to us. Your sense cravings are nothing more than a restlessness of the mind. The mind is not content with what is happening in this moment and thinks that if only I had this, something would, something more magical would happen. I would be happy. <coughs> and so it, <coughs> reaches out for that, <clears throat> whether it's a bowl of ice cream or some other treat. And of course, for a moment, for a moment, that craving is satisfied. And so the natural 
spontaneous joy that is within surfaces. And we think, oh yes, this is it. And so we seek another bowl of ice cream and so on. Well, ultimately we come to the realization, particularly if we do spiritual practices, that this is futile. We'll have this momentary satisfaction and then we'll, it'll disappear and our, our restless mind will go on to something else. Well, if it wasn't that, then it must be this, and so on. So this is the process of purification. Slowly and slowly for most people, but with an accelerated uh, pace for those who practice spiritual disciplines, purification happens. As that does happen, the eyes become clearer particularly the spiritual eye, begins to be able to see, oh, this is what is meant by revelation. I, that, that which was hidden is being revealed. What was hidden? Your true original nature. Your, the, the indwelling Atman, the Saguna Atman, the Atman with attributes, doesn't participate, but has the attributes of the divine. You begin to perceive these things. You actually see them, they are revealed to you. And as they are revealed, you begin to have a greater and greater sense of the infinite of which you are a distillation. The finite being, as we're told by the teachers, is a distillation, a compendium, a compound of the aspects of the infinite, the changeless, the eternal. So we have these uh, aspects to us of the unchanging, the eternal, and the infinite, but we don't normally see it. So as we begin to see it, our whole view of ourselves, the world we live in, and the other people we share this world with, especially our fellow uh, uh, spiritual aspirants, of course, it'll change our opinion of our family, of our friends, those people who aren't participating as well. But because as we see ourselves differently, it's not possible to not see them differently. And so you treat them differently. And this is the road to salvation. When you begin to treat the entire world differently, you are no longer bound to that world. But let's stick with Revelation for a while. Revelation is something that happens incrementally. If it happened all at once, it would burn out our nervous system. Uh, this is why we don't have the highest forms of Samadhi all at once. Our nervous system couldn't take the load. So it happens bit by bit. But it is joyous as it happens. Because we sense our increasing freedom. We sense our increasing joy at being unlimited. And we begin to see in the lives of those around us, how they also are not as limited as they think they are. So having come this far and having said these things, is there anything about what was read by Cindy or what was said since then that 
brings to your mind a comment you would like to make about your own experience or any concern or question you would like to raise. Anything at all from anyone. All right. Revelation. As I said, in, it has a meaning in common speech as well. It means, oh, something, something was shown to me that I didn't know before. And it could be something you read in a book, something you heard on a news show, but it is an opening. And so as we ponder on these things, we see, particularly as a spiritual aspirant, that it is going on all the time. That our world, our infinitude, <coughs> is being revealed to us. So we go on with the idea of, I will want to know more. As I know more, I will become more. As I become more, I will be more effective. What does effective mean? Effective means I will be more radiant in the world. And my radiance will have an, a, a tangible effect wherever I am, wherever I go. If I go to the supermarket and I'm in the checkout line, mm -hmm. whether they know it or see it or not, see it with their physical eyes, they will, uh, the people before us and behind us in that checkout line will feel better they will feel better because we are present. The checker will have a different kind of experience than she or he would have with someone else. They may not remark on it in the moment, but it is felt. <clears throat> now, is this any cause for pride? Of course not. As we know, as Sri Ramakrishna said, as Christ said, God alone is the doer. I and my Father are one. I am the vine, ye are the branches. So it is that Father that is doing through me. And Sri Ramakrishna was also expressly expressed this. I think as you would have me think. I speak as you would have me speak. I act as you would have me act. And this is what happens as revelation goes on. You become more and more like the primordial Atman, the, the, the source of your being. You become, you mirror more and more closely what that is and, and why it exists in this world. So once again, I'm going to pause there and ask, is there anything that anyone would like to comment from their own experience about any of these things or anything else that we've discussed over the weeks uh, or any concern or question that you would like to raise? I'll jump in here. Okay. Um. You used the word before we even got started. I can't remember the exactly what you said, but you used the word beloved, and we use that a lot. And I was thinking about that word earlier this morning and thinking, you know, it's composed of two words, be loved. Mm -hmm. and And then jumping forward to what you were talking about being in the checkout line. Um, 
we are social beings, you know, in our embodied manifest forms, mm -hmm. and we want to share what we have and what, and if all we have is grumpiness, we want to share that. So we, we uh, cast grump, grumpiness on everybody around us. Mm -hmm. And then we bring, we bring down the vibe, man, you know, seriously. And yet the opposite of that is if you have that freedom from a certain amount of attachment, none of us have it completely, but even a little bit can buoy us up. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you are in the midst of other people, you're throwing that, you're sharing that. Yes, you're radiating. Whether you mean to or not, you know, just like your grumpiness, whether you mean to or not, you are sharing whatever you carry into a space of other people. Precisely. And why it's so very important to become radiant because you just improve the quality of the atmosphere wherever you are. For yourself and everyone else. Yes. Plants and animals included. Exactly. And, you know, people say, well, what can I do? I'm just one person and I don't do this and that and the other and, you know, all these active karma yoga things. And the thing is, is that the most important thing you can do, whether you do those other things or not, the most important thing is free yourself. Yes. Conquer right. yourself, as Dr. Lee said. <laughs> yes. Conquer well, yourself. Well, Swami Swahananda was once encouraging his young monastics to become speakers on the podium there at the Hollywood Center. And one of them said to him, well, Swami, what do I know that I can share that will be important enough to listen to? And the Swami says, said to him, it doesn't matter so much what you say, your life will speak for you. And that is exactly what Cindy was addressing. Your life will speak for you. And if your heart is devoted to the beloved, which is your true original nature, and you are feeling that as you move through your day, it transforms the world around you. It transforms the space you live in, and as Cindy pointed out, the, the space that the animals that you share that space with will feel it and, and experience it, and anyone that you encounter out in the world. And when two people, it's like Sri, Sri Ramakrishna said, when uh, two hemp smokers uh, you know, him being the, the word for uh, ganja, uh, marijuana, uh, in, uh, in Bengal. When two hemp smokers uh, meet one another, they laugh and embrace. And, this, and the same is true of spiritual. And he was using this as an illustration of what happens when two spiritual seekers encounter one another. So indeed we do. Uh, we, um, yes, please, Oma. Uh, talking about sharing and spreading, I would say, not only sharing, but spread in joy. And uh, you mentioned about life itself exhibiting that joy, that radiance. Speaking about which, I remember what Mahatma Gandhi said. Somebody asked, some journalist asked him, Mahatma Ji, what is your message to the world? And Gandhi Ji said, my life is my message. Yes. 
And, and that is so powerful because he lived that. He did not just speak or uh, in, intentionally try to influence, but his very presence, his being, his, and you feel it sometimes when some such soul appears before you, you feel the vibes. Yes. You automatically get attracted and influenced. So how does it happen when that person exudes love and radiance by living that life? And that perfectly exemplifies what you are saying. My life is my message. The way you speak, the way you treat others, the way you even not agree but disagree with others. And how you resolve your problems, which we all have. So that to me is the gist of what you're saying, radiance. Yes. Well, most of us did not. I, I would say that no one present this morning had the opportunity to be in the physical presence of Gandhiji. Yeah. But many of us have the, the privilege and the joy of sharing the world with the Dalai Lama. Yeah. If we, if we see what he is and does yeah. and how he transforms the atmosphere wherever he goes. I've never been, uh, well, I was once in his physical presence long, long ago in Pomona, California. But uh, uh, mostly I've seen him on television and so on. And you can see how people, particularly political people, who otherwise believe, uh, behave a little bit uh, aggressively or assertively, or be even belligerently. They don't do that in his presence. Uh, there's something else. So we are graced, we are graced with this revelation of our true nature. If we lean in that direction, it's just exactly as Cindy was pointing out, as Uma was pointing out. It transforms the, the way things occur around us. We don't have to make things happen. They happen by the will of the divine. And our participation is part of the energy that makes that happen. Anything else from anyone? Anyone who would like to speak, please do. Yes, yes, brother. You know, I was been thinking about this a lot about what you just said, but you know, one of the things for me is when I can let go and let go of the the uh, attachment for the, the outcome and and just let go of any type of care of what the outcome is. And then it's just like you become that rag doll and and it it just flows around you and you're not doing anything. But as soon as I start grabbing on to the outcome again, then I become the doer. And, uh -huh. you know, but in those moments, you know, of that, you know, in those revelations where you realize that there's no need to to care about an outcome and you just let go and it flows and you're there well said Bhagavan. well said as always and that's I'd like, exactly I'd, it i'd like to say something since you mentioned the dalai lama okay um, years ago there was a show uh fire in line with william f buckley a, a lot of the older people here have probably seen it buckley was like a, a very sort of like aggressive uh, intellectual. He was he was entertaining. He had a lot of interesting people on his program. He was a right wing uh, 
philosopher, intellectual, whatever. But so the Dalai Del Lama comes on and uh, Buckley starts being his aggressive intellectual self and the Dalai Lama just starts laughing at him and touching his knee. And uh, it was just amazing to see how Buckley was disarmed. Yeah. I, just, I just looked to see if that video is available online and it is. If anybody's interested, just do a Google on William F. Buckley, Dalai Lama, and you'll find the video. Oh, well, thanks for the tip. And don't, don't think that that touch on the knee was incidental. He was transmitting some, some energy, some power by yeah. touch on his knee. And, and as you say, Buckley, I knew, I watched that program often because Buckley was very sharp intellectually and asked some very pertinent questions. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, it was very interesting to see him del disarm the Dalai Lama. Uh, and I, I liked your use of the word disarm. There was no armament about the Dalai Lama. His arms were open and extended uh, for an embrace. Thank you, Tom. Thank you as always. And thanks for the tip that that's still available to us online. I'll probably watch it. I was actually in the room with the Dalai <clears throat> Lama, I think in 2009 when he uh -huh. came here. And I'd never felt the sense that usually I feel like, you know, among people, I'm pretty smart in the room and all that kind of thing. But I could tell that the people in the room were a product of successive generations of, of better thought and, and lineage. And, you know, I felt inadequate, really. And, oh. I, and I realized that, you know, the, the, you know, that they are a product of a, a long tradition of, of better thinking. I don't know how to put it, but you could, I could just feel it. Well, you can bet that the Dalai Lama would not have seen you as inadequate, simply uh, yet to be as fully developed as you could be, which are obviously you're moving along splendidly in that direction. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to recognize what you just recognized in your own self and in your behavior and in, the, in those people you were in the room with. Well said, as always, Bhagavan does. That was very good. I'll, I'll make one other Dalai Lama comment. Uh, I saw him twice when he came to Atlanta. The first time, he wasn't quite so popular, and it was held in a church uh, with a manageable crowd. And some you had to write down the questions for him. And somebody wrote down this question, like, what should we do with our lives? That's, what's the best thing to do with our lives to make the world a better place? Something along those lines. And he looked at the question, he looked at the crowd, and then he just said, I don't know. Uh, and that was just such a relief. You know, I was so tired of, of spiritual teachers uh, that, want, that felt like they needed to have all the answers. Yes. Have a guy stand in front of, you know, hundreds of people say, I don't know. Uh, anyway, it, it was a big relief to me, and I loved it. Good. And the second time you saw him? Second time, it, it, he was more popular, and it was in a big uh, amphitheater. At, oh. uh, yeah, it was at Gwinnett Arena. Well, no, this was at Emory. Oh. Uh, yes, Emory. Yeah. Emory. yeah. The, the first time, he was at this church at Emory. And then the second time, he was in a big uh, amphitheater-type thing at Emory. It was like a gymnasium or something. Yeah, yeah gymnasium. Yeah. I was, I was there. Well, probably some others of us were there, but I got to sit right up front in the press, little press box with Tom Watson. I had my press, my press pass. <laughs> I was a press assistant, but it was great being that close to him, especially in that big room. And I just, you know, sometimes it was hard to understand him. Yeah. But I just loved his laugh, you know, and <laughs> exactly, <laughs> you know, and I can imagine when he answered that question and said, I don't know that there was a laugh or a twinkly, his twinkly eyes were part of that. <laughs> I totally agree. 
uh, good times at Emory. I was there. And if somebody asks question, you just look at him and touch him and say, I don't know. And then he gives such an infectious laughter. Oh. And that was very, as if that answered everything. That look, here I am, uh, just natural presence and joy exuding from his very being. So that that's how I felt that he answered by just being childlike, totally childlike. I really like your use of the word infectious, is infectious laughter. Yes. That's exactly what I was getting at when I say, as revelation occurs within you, yep. and you are, the truth of your being is revealed. Yes. It becomes infectious in the room you're in, the people you're with. <clears throat> and this, <clears throat> as, as uh, was said by Ramana Maharshi, <clears throat> the greatest gift that you can give to the world is to come to know who you truly are. Uh -huh. Carl Jung said essentially the same thing from two different perspectives, very different perspectives, the same conclusion. The greatest gift that you can give to the world is to come to know who you truly are. Who are you? You are, as Ramana Maharshi said, the one, the one. And that one, though it seems to us, as we sit here this morning, with all these screens in front of us, you know, looking at all these different people, it seems that we are many, but we're told over and over, no, we are one. I am the vine, you're the branches. There's no separation between the vine and the branches, and there's no separation between what the vine is rooted in and the vine itself. The vine is rooted in that inexpressible uh, God the Father. So that's what Christ called it, God the Father. Though that's not a that's not a, a real name. It's just a gesture in the direction of this infinite, indefinable energy that gave rise to the Christ. And then he uh, says of his followers, you are the branches, again, inseparable. We are inseparable from the divinity that gives rise to us. We are the branches. Anything else from anyone? I was just going to say that, you know, if you watch uh, Sarvadevananda's, you know, class on the Gospel of Ramakrishna, when he goes off topic and starts telling little stories and making jokes, he's literally the same way, like as the Dalai Lama, where you just get that that feeling. <laughs> yeah, that eternal teacher, the eternal teacher that appears as as uh, as the face of Sarvadevananda. It is, as you say, so charming. What time is it? 11.33. Oh my goodness, we have lots of time. So let's just talk a little more. Well, is there anything else from anyone first? Before yeah. we, yes, please. Just talking about revelation and the word and what it means, the different meanings. And um, uh, I think you used a word, eh, well, reveal, you know, re something being revealed to you. Um, and I like to think of it as being uncovered. Yes. Um, and Tom Carr and I were talking yesterday and about uh you know things things that we believed at least in the moment to be true or likely true or likely not true and and it, it 
to me, you know, my personal experience, everybody's personal experience informs their beliefs and their values. Um, it's, you know, people who, for instance, a big revelation for a human being to have is, is something to do with um, what's beyond this life, if anything. And people who have near-death experiences often report being no longer afraid of death. Um, that's a huge thing, and but they have to have that experience before that happens to them. Because just simply believing it, you know, the most religious, fervently religious person who believes what they've heard and read about the afterlife, their conviction is nothing compared to these people. This is my opinion, who actually have this taste of it. And the same with people who have a taste of samadhi or any kind of uh, liberation of that sort to have that taste. And that's all it takes to mm -hmm. keep you going that direction. Uh, that it's important. It's important that we have those experiences. Um, and they don't have to be grand. <laughs> they don't have to be near-death experiences or, you know, things we read about. Just something that's a little different from your everyday life that happens because of your spiritual practice or just happens to you. Um, exactly, dear. And, and then something talking. is revealed. Yeah. That's yeah. really what Prabhu Ananda was saying in the Sermon on the Mound is that the bedrock is that experience that, you know, the unshakable faith is that bedrock. And until you have that experience, you don't have that bedrock. Exactly. You have you have working faith, but not what uh, in Sanskrit is called shraddha, that unshakable, indomitable uh, courage and faith based on experience. And so th this near-death experience people, we'll talk a bit about that next week in the talk on salvation. Um, because these people, uh, they feel when they're in that space that they visit, uh, they feel as if they've been saved. And they oftentimes do not want to come back to their physical body at all. Sometimes, well, obviously all of those who report to us have come back to their physical body. Uh, they tell us that there are some who do not have to, but uh, there are, they come back and they tell us of these things. And as Cindy said, she used the word uncovered. That's it. It is, it is, Vivekananda tells us again and again and again in his writings, and his, his speeches, his talks, not so much his writings. Uh, he mentions it in, in Raja Yoga, the only book he wrote, but the, the idea that the truth of our being is already fully present within each one of us each one of us, and it is only to be uncovered or discovered. And this we do by sinking into the silence that is below our thoughts and emotions and senses. In, in spiritual practice, we sink below those into the silence that is the voice of the Atma the Saguna Atma. We hear the voice. And as, as Meister Eckhart said, the language of God is silence. All else is a poor translation. And so we, we find this within ourselves. And it is transformative. And it is that transformation that is being spoken of as revelation. 
we are revealed to ourselves. And as has been pointed out by more than one of us in, in our comments this morning, when we see it in ourselves, it's absolutely unavoidable to see it in others. And so we treat others differently. And whether they recognize why or not is not material. They will be transformed to that extent simply by being in our presence. This is the power of revelation. Anything else from anyone? I have a question. Yes, uh, dear. Sometimes uh, as you go into meditation or silence, as you say, what if you discover not only pleasant aspects, but the darker aspects of yourself. And uh, just like it's like feathering a sea, an ocean, as you go deep into it, you may come up with some debris, some ugly things in yourself, not only truth, but not only pleasant aspects, but the darker aspects of yourself. At that time, that revelation doesn't seem to be very, to our ego, it doesn't seem to be very pleasant. So how do you deal with it? Well, Sri Ramakrishna and Vivekananda are very explicit that there cannot be a universe of only light. Yeah. There is light and there is darkness. Yes. Necessarily. Now we are made of that material that is the universe. We are compounded of that. And so then we'll find within ourselves these dark aspects. Uh, Vivekananda found them in himself. Babaram, uh, Swami Premananda, found them in himself. So it isn't as if we're unusual in finding these things in ourselves. And we simply have to say, this too is there. And the only way that it will be in any way useful to us is when we shine the light of our awareness and intelligence on it, recognize it for what it is, and admit along with St. Francis of Assisi, the only way that true love and compassion can, flu, can flow from your eyes and lips is if you too will admit that you are capable of any act. And so our darkness uh, can be deep, uh, pressed deeply enough, we will do unpleasant things. Uh, speak sharply to someone, tell a lie to yeah. protect ourselves. You know, all of these things will happen. Well, as we just, the only refuge we can take, as I understand it, is this idea that there is no universe without that potential, as well as the potential for the expression of our uh, infinite brilliance. So is that a good answer? Uh, so we need to work on it or speak by spiritual practices to change the substance. The, the well, it, it, it won't change, dear. It only dissolves when we finally dissolve as an embodied being. But uh, we can 
recognize it and therefore limit its potential for harm mm -hmm. by saying, I see what is arising here, mm -hmm. anger, greed, hatred, mm -hmm. all of the impediments. Mm -hmm. So then we do not allow them to mm -hmm. take sway. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we say, no, I'm not going to do that greedy thing. Mm -hmm. I have the opportunity to to snatch away something, but I'm not going to do it. But well, it's not nice. It's not nice. But don't dwell on it. And exactly. Don't dilute. Well, whatever we dwell on <clears throat> is becomes our becomes our prison. <clears throat> Even if we dwell on the light of sight of ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's not the truth, it's not the full truth of ourselves. It's simply an aspect of ourselves. Mm -hmm. We are not limited. Mm -hmm. We are not, we have no, there is no definition that will correctly fit any of us. Mm -hmm. There are just approximate definitions. Thank you. Anything else from anyone pursuing this? Um, brother Gaurav here. Yes, Gaurav. Um, yeah, the thing is uh, kind of tagging uh, on to whatever Umaji was saying. Um, whenever, uh, this is my personal experience, whenever you have these negative thoughts or whatever is going on, try to, I don't know, meditate on Divine Mother or whichever form of the Divine you're attached to. And then, then I, I don't know if it's by the grace of the divine that you're gradually able to be numb to those things and you tend to get an objective view of yourself, like a bird's eye view of yourself. And you realize that that's only the body. That's only the spacesuit that's given to you. You're, you're, you're somebody else altogether. You're not doing anything. It's, it's her working through it and, and you start letting go of things. And once you do it, it's like it never existed or something. I don't know. It's numbing. And then you're just in a different plane. Very, very well said, Dora. You know, when we, when we repeat with Sri Ramakrishna, uh, I think as you would have me think. Therefore, I speak as you would have me speak and act as you would have me act. Then as you say, these things do not have the effect on us that they would otherwise. If you put it all at mother's feet, at master's feet and say, so be it, let it be this way. And and, and brother, on, on tagging on to that, I also have this feeling that I really don't I don't exist or I am not, I am, I is nothing. It's like, it's her and divine. That's all it is. I, I don't own anything. I don't have anything. I, I, <laughs> I'm just, uh, just here uh, to, on a ride, I guess, but whatever it is that I. What a precious experience you have, Gaurav, to be able to say that. That is the, that is the, that is part of the goal if we can say goal that uh, that each of us is seeking, that experience is that I am nothing. I am everything and I am nothing all at once. And so, precious, thank you for sharing that. You know, this reminds me of the, you know, the breaker of the world's change, you know, where it's like the light and the dark, you know, when we're in duality, we're bound by law. You know, that's this yep. universe is bound by law. That's just part of the law. But, you know, and it says that chains of iron or chains are gold, no less strong to bind that, you know, light or dark. But like you're saying, the only way is to not is to not be either of them, to 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 remove that will and and just be the rag doll, you know, the kitten. Yeah. 
and and then you know neither side is binding you. Now, I, uh, Bhagavan Das brings up the kitten consciousness. <laughs> and there's a very, very important spiritual principle that uh, Sri Ramakrishna speaks of. There are two ways of being with the Divine Mother. You can have the monkey mind and uh, cling to the mother's back and jump off when it suits you when it suits your ego to do so, you can do that. In which case you may fall. Mm. You may have a bad fall. <laughs> or you can pursue a life as the kitten mind. The kitten is put wherever the mother puts it. As it said in the parable, as Sri Ramakrishna puts it, sometimes she will put it on the hearth. Sometimes she will put it on the bed. She and it wherever the the kitten is put, it stays there. It doesn't try to go where it feels it should go. It simply says mew mew and stays where it does. Now this you've used the word rag doll a couple of times, uh Bhagavan does. Could you give us uh, a little bit of an explanation? Well, I mean, of where that metaphor comes from. The, yeah, I mean, well, I'm just saying, it's like, could, could you just feel, uh, you know, like the rag doll is placed; it doesn't have any ability to animate itself. I see. Say, you know what I mean? Yes. Yes, the rag doll is put on the shelf, put on the bed, uh, lying on the on the child's pillow. Uh, gets kicked onto the floor. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rag doll is, it does not have any will of its own. Very well. Uh, I'm, uh, I see where you're, why you're using that metaphor or simile. That's very good. Brother Shankara, I have a yes. comment I want to add to all of everybody's wisdom. Uh, like the darkness we talked about, knowing my darkness is the best method to deal with the darkness of others, said Carl Jang. And that makes us deal with other people's darkness. When we start seeing through this revelation, we start realizing we are just like anyone else. And, yeah. and the word, as we the revelation happens after the purification, the hate runs away from you. It's scared of you, actually. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Like Francis St. Francis said, the love and compassion, kindness settles in. Then we become much calmer towards the hatred. Even the most hated people in the world or anyone, we don't hate them anymore. We look at them through different lenses. Mm -hmm. It's no longer hatred. Oh, how sad this person is not grown yet that's what we will think we won't say i hate anymore that even if we had said it in the past but that word runs away from you it's scared of you anymore that's that's a kind of litmus test for our revelations mm -hmm. uh, that's how i personally feel i personally very agree. very nicely said thank A you. litmus test for our revelation yes when when our vision of ourself changes, mm -hmm. it is absolutely impossible to see other people the same way that we did before. So if, as uh, was just said, we have been using the word hatred or I hate that person, I hate those. No, as the Christians say, Abominate the sin, love the sinner. Yes, yes. Abominate the sin. Exactly. The sin. And uh, if we love ourselves as the divine presence, then we must necessarily love the other as the divine presence. And it is in living that life, as Swami Swakhananda said, it will speak for us. We don't have to say anything. We don't have to say, I see you as this. 
they will simply be evident that you're seeing the person in a different way, as we see, as this group that gathered here this morning. We see one another differently than we see uh, or have seen others. Uh, and so having this experience transforms our experience of others as well. How are we doing for time? Just got five more minutes. Very good. Thank you. And then when the awareness comes that you're doing that and that your reality is literally of, of your choices and preferences that you're making, and then you become aware of how you're shaping it. And, you know, then that paradox comes to where you can't see yourself as the Atman and the divine and then not see others the same way. Right. You know? Well said as always. Yes. We cannot, how we see ourselves is how we're going to see the world around us. As Goethe said, a man sees in the world what he carries in his heart. Exactly, exactly. So if we, if we carry this image of ourselves as, a, as the loving, transforming, infinite being, then that's what we'll see around us. And we do see around us. Anything else? Brother, else? Brother, brother, this is Fred, sorry. Yes, I'm, Fred. No, go ahead, Fred. Um, namaste and hello to everybody in the class. And uh, really appreciate all the comments. Um, it, it's, it seems like, to me, we always hear about delusion or the illusion of the world and everything. Right? So what is the main delusion, you know? What is Maya consist of? Um, and I almost feel like I heard uh, from what Gora shared, talking about that delusion, and it seems like to me, it's identification, whether you are fully identified with the person and what person are you fully identified? <clears throat> There's two ways to talk about it, right? Like what you just said is a positive look at it through being a different kind of being. And, and maybe the negating way to look at it is I am not fully identified with the limited or the apparent personal. Um, I was like, I, I don't know. I, I appreciate everyone's comments, though. It's beautiful. Well, and, and those two ideas are not uh, contradictory to one another. Uh, you can be, as Gaurav said, you can have this feeling of I am nothing. And yet you have to admit in the moment you appear to be something. So the two things can exist simultaneously. You can believe truly that the delusion that I'm experiencing is that I am something. And the truth is I am nothing. And this is what the great saints will all tell you. If you read the book, Love Forms from God, you'll find that each of those saints in their own way tells you that I am nothing. The divine is everything. And it takes whatever form it takes that expresses itself as me. And, and that is not a, that is not a limited thing. They'll all tell you, I was then, I am now. I am here for you right now. From Rabia at the beginning of the book to Tukaram at the end of the book, uh, you find that they say, I am here for you right now. <clears throat> and these poems, which Ladinsky so beautifully interpreted for us, these love poems from God, they are all the testimony of saints. 
well worth your attention for any of you who haven't yet uh, laid hands on that book. Brother, uh, kind of uh, tagging along with this conversation, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm almost thinking about it and it feels like we, we are like talking about the Holy Trinity in Christianity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Like, uh, divine is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient, and I am He is what would be the final realization. Yes. And Precisely. The, 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 the Trinity is just simply a different way of talking about the exact same things. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Each of those, it's a Father, the non-dual. Son, the qualified non-dual. And the Holy Ghost, the dual. So this is this is the Christian one of the Christian expressions of not of the of the these those three ways of thinking. So we are the more we plunge into this, the more revelation comes, but the more difficult it becomes to express it because it is not a thing of common speech. It is not a thing of our ordinary language. It is something beyond that. And so we find our way to it slowly and slowly. And then it expands for us slowly and slowly and transforms us ultimately completely. And that's what we'll talk about next week under the topic salvation. What does it mean to be saved? Uh, Brother Shantara? Yes, dear. Um, revelation. Would uh, uh, we use another word? Can we also say that revelation? is self-realization. Yes. These two are very, seem to me like identical. When well, you yes. look to self. Well, so, when, we, when we achieve realization, yeah. what are we realizing? We're realizing yeah. our true self. So yes, it's self-realization. Yes. Exactly, you're very right. Thank you. Anything else from anyone? Brother, uh, just one more point, actually, because we're talking about uh, identifying with the divine. Um, I believe, uh, like, I think there's a chant about Lord Shiva, uh, the divine father, where it says that I am not this, I'm not that. I am not sorrow. I'm not joy. I am pure consciousness, I am pure bliss, I am Shiva. Yeah, I am Shiva. I am Shiva, Shiva, Shiva. Yeah. Chidananda Rupa, Chidananda Rupa, Shiva. 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 So that is exactly the same stuff, I think. Exactly. There's just, each of the lineages or traditions, and there are a number in Sanatana Dharma, which is the proper name for Hinduism, and there are a number in, in Christianity. I mean, Judeo-Christian thought contains a number of different um, ways of approaching this. Catholicism is one, Methodism is another, so on and so forth, Baptists. Um, so, uh, and it's not up to us to judge, you know, as if we were uh, selecting who should be in each pew, so to speak. No, the divine selects and offers to that person that which will nurture them. Mm. As, it, as we say it in the opening prayer, may the divine support and 
nourish us. And that nourishment comes to us. Uh, it's not just a physical thing of something to eat. It is the nourishment of our spiritual self. You know, consciousness wouldn't be infinite if everybody had the same realization. <laughs> that, precisely. Yes, infinitude. And th this is the thing that the, the, the testimony of the saints tell us. That there is reason to believe that the universe exists so that the divine presence can experience itself in its infinitude, which means it goes on forever and forever and forever. That is probably the precise, that is pro precisely the reason why we say personal God means at least I believe in that. My connection with the divine is very personal and yes. very unique. And that is the most, that kind of explains why it is infinite. Everybody has their personal experience. Yes. Very well said. Anything else from anyone before we close? All right, dears. The next time we'll have an opportunity to meet, of course, is Tuesday, when we'll get together for our class, our reading and discussion of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna with Haima as our beloved reader. Uh, any final thought or concern or question from anyone? All right, dears. Shankara? Yes. Shankara? Um, I, I had to go, go grab my Love Poems from God book. Yes. Um, but I had just read this poem by St. John the Divine just the other night, and um, I just wanted to share it. Please do. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's called Development. Once I said to God, how do you teach us? And he replied, if you were playing chess with someone who had infinite power and infinite knowledge and wanted to make you a master of the game, what would all the chess pieces where would all the chess pieces be at every moment? Indeed, not only where he wanted them, but where all were best for your development. And that is every situation of one's life. Beautiful. And again, this is one of the poems of these that is a testimony, an actual life experience testimony of a conversation with God by Saint John with Divine, Saint John the Divine. He's not making this up that he had this conversation with God. He had this conversation with God. And uh, in answer to the question, how do you teach us? This is how God answered. How priceless are these poems? Yes. I just realized it's St. John of the Cross and not St. John the Divine. St. <laughs> John of the Cross. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's quite all right. Uh, most of us wouldn't have known the difference. Uh, I didn't remember the difference. Uh, but St. John of the Cross. Yes. So he's one of the 12 uh, saints that is uh, in the Love Poems from God book. And thank you for sharing that, Lori. That is just exactly right. God teaches us in a way that will aid our development, which of course is a technical term in chess. You can look it up if you like. Well, the way you, the way you play your pieces is uh, in chess. Is the it's said that is the way you develop your side of the board, <clears throat> and if your development is more um, is stronger 
than the other person's, you will win. So it's very, it's a very good use of the pun. Thank you, Lori. Anything else from anyone? Yes, yes, Shankar. Exactly how to play uh, those, what are they called? Things that you put here in chess. And that reminds me of Bhagavad Gita, uh, second chapter, when Krishna says, Yoga is karma su kaushalam. What is yoga? Yoga is skill in action. Uh -huh. So that ap applies how we play the game of life. Oh, yes. And the game of chess. Yes. I have sat and watched a chess master uh -huh. play 25 people at once. And the chess master was wearing a blindfold. Wow. And could not see each of the boards of the opponent he was playing against. Of those 25 people, he defeated 24. One managed a draw, which is a very difficult thing against a chess master. So this was a very highly developed player but 24 people were, de were defeated by a man who was wearing a blindfold and couldn't and was remembering each board he was playing of 25 different people. Wow. Mind. But, you know, he, his mind, and I didn't know the man personally, but he was known as being otherwise very limited in his life. He didn't do anything really except play chess. So his, you know, it isn't what we would have thought of as the most auspicious way to live, but it certainly was a successful way for this man to live. Yeah, but imagine the, the, the singleness of focus I mean, I can see where you could find the Ananda in that. Oh, yes. If you were looking. <laughs> if you were looking for the Ananda. And uh, doubtless he did find it, whether he called it that or thought about it that way or not. Otherwise, why would he have continued with such a difficult way of life? All right, dears. Anything from anyone else? All right. May you all be well and in bright spirits. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai. Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may the mother and father that opens our prayer with which we start these sessions. May we understand that that mother and father holds us securely in a loving and protective embrace. May you each be well and in bright spirits until Tuesday for those of you who decide to join us at that time. See you then. Oh, Shankara? Yes, dear. Are, are you up for having people over this afternoon? I certainly am. Anyone okay. who'd like Great. to come. Great. Thanks. Okay. And thanks to everybody. Thank <laughs> Always. You. Thank you all. Bye-bye all. Bye. Enjoy, Mark.